Okay, the other type of buckling problem that I want you to be able to solve is a little bit artificial, but I'm going to... Um, it has the elements of some concepts I want to convey. So we're going to do it in this manner. And this is sort of a frame that consists of, you know, one column here, one column here, and uh, a beam that goes across, and we have a load. And what we want to do is to determine whether this column buckles, or this column buckles, or they both buckle, or what. Okay, so in this particular case, um, I'm showing the cross sections of the two columns. So the cross section of uh, so uh, column AB, this is column AB, column CD, column CD. Okay. So the question and E is given, and the question is, do these buckle? How do we solve this? Well, we're going to start by finding the p-criticals for the two columns. And if we look at it, we see that this one is fixed, fixed. This one is pinned, pinned. So that's going to give us our k's. So in other words, for column AB, we're going to have a k of 0.5 because it's fixed, fixed. For CD, we're going to have a K of 1 because it is pin pin. So our expression is pi squared EI over KL quantity squared. And so we have our pi squared, E is given, um, K is 0.5, the length is 10. The only thing that really needs to be calculated here is our um, I. What do I have to do in this particular case? We have our, you know, it's an our I beam cross section. So I have to create. I have to um, calculate both I X X and I Y Y. So to calculate my I X X, I use that, and we know that we can create or calculate the um, moment of inertia is 112 B outer H outer cubed minus 112 B out inner H inner cubed. I'm not going to go through that because we've done that enough times. I can compute my moment of inertia XX. I flip it around, make it look like that. I calculate, I've already covered this also. So I'm not going to go through it in detail. I can figure out the moment of inertia for that one. You can look at that, and I get my I, Y, Y. I compare these two, and what do I find? I find that the, um, the I, Y, Y is the smallest of the two. So I put that, so I put this value into here, the smaller I, goes there, and um, I get a p-critical of 28.81 kips. For this one, it's for the CD cross-section, it's easy to see which is the smallest I. It's going to be 1 12th um, BH cubed, where the B is 0.8. B is 0.8. The H is 0.1. So, I can easily see that. That gives me my smallest I. I get my I there. So, for my p-critical CD, pi squared, E is given, I is the one we just calculated. And um, the K is 1, L. Okay, so we have p-critical for both. And remember... Like I said, you view p-critical as being the a property of the column. And 
now we need to figure out what are the loads in the columns. So how do we do that? Well, we evaluate it by our beam. There's the load for our beam. We get the reactions. We get AY. We get CY. And, um, you know, I'm not going to go through this. Take some of the moments about A, some of the moments about C. I get the reactions. And then what do I do? I compare the reactions to the P-criticals. So what do I find? A Y is 32. P critical for A B is 28.8. .8. What do I see? My load is greater than the P critical, so it buckles. My C Y is 8 kips, but my P critical for C D is 0.91. Again, it's bigger, so that one buckles also. Buckles. Now, here's another one, somewhat similar. I'm not going to go through all the details, but it's um, quite similar here. I have that is pin pin, that's fixed pin, so. For AC, my K is 1. For BC, my K is 0.7. I want to find my P critical. Here, here are my cross sections. And in both cases, what do I, I have to use B as 0.4 for that. I have to use B as 0.6 for that one. H is 0.2. H is 0.1 to get my minimum moment of inertia. So, um, what do I find? Um, you know, I have my my E is given again, and so I find that I have um, my pi squared EI over KL quantity squared gives me 36.6 kips for AC my pi squared EI over KL squared for BD gives me 5.03. And then I get my, again, I look at this beam, I get my reactions. We're not going to go through that again because you can all do that. I get my reaction at A is 23.6. My reaction at B is 10.4. And and so I'm going to compare my reactions to my p-criticals. And, and what do I find? Well, let's take a look at um, the... Um, so let's, let's compare, let's look at BD, for instance. So p-critical BD is 5.03, but my reaction at B is 10.4 kips. So what do I see? My reaction is greater than my p-critical. That means that member BD buckles. And um, so now <laughs> And again, this is a little bit artificial, but what happens? What do we know? If member BD buckles, then all of the load gets transferred to member AC. So now the load on member AC is what? The sum of these two, which is if I add those two together, that gives me um, 34 kips. So now my reaction or my load in AC is not 23.6, it's 34. So now I'm going to take the 34 and I'm going to compare it to P-critical AC 
which is 36.6. So um, what we find is that, uh, so we take the 34 kips, but we see that the 36.6 from the peak critical is bigger than, than the 34, so member AC does not buckle. So the I want you to transfer, if one of the members buckles, I want you to transfer the load to the other member and see if it buckles. Like I say, it's a little bit artificial, but it conveys some aspects of what of a progressive failure. So the answer in, in this case is that that member BD does buckle, but member AC does not buckle. All right, we'll stop there.